Hey everybody, I've got an update on my 3 rick 6502 project. In review, I've built a 6502 computer on breadboards to play my favorite childhood games of Load Runner and now Ultima 4. It's been a fun journey exploring the 6502 computer, computer architecture, electrical and software engineering. When I was in fourth grade in the 80s, I went around telling people that I was going to build a computer. I had a rival at this time, and needless to say, he wouldn't let me forget my assertion for years. He literally mocked me every time I saw him. The truth is, at the time, my dad had talked about buying a Heathkit computer and putting it together. In the end, he bought an Atari 1200XL, which is a computer that I truly loved. Now, my passion for computers has helped me do pretty well, but with that said, maybe this is why the Ben Eater 6502 kit struck such a nerve with me. Anyway, I've made some great progress and wanted to share the latest. As you may have seen in previous videos, I've got the system working quite well on breadboards. A working keyboard, mouse, SNES joystick, an original micro SD DOS, as well as support for custom Apple II disk-ish emulator. I'm able to load and run tons of Apple II software. I didn't know I was building an Apple II when I started, but the allure of the software catalog has led me there. The trick now is, how do I get it off of breadboards and onto a PCB? Honestly, the hardest part with this was wanting to start. The problem is super daunting. I've made PCBs in the past, and this effort on breadboards started with a schematic. However, in the course of creating the color graphics, the mocking board sound support, and the disk emulation, I've done quite a bit of tinkering on the breadboards without updating the schematics. One of the approaches that I considered was to take the breadboards apart wire by wire and to update the schematic as I go to make it match. I got some pretty unanimous feedback from folks to not do this and I gave it a second thought. Instead I decided to build a model of the breadboard. I used a free tool called DIY Layout Creator. I used the continuity tester on a multimeter and I tested every connection on every chip and used it to rebuild the breadboard in digital form. This took a while, but it has proven to be pretty helpful. If I ever accidentally pull out a wire somewhere, which happens, it's pretty easy now to figure out where it should go. Also, the layout creator has a cool feature where you can select a pin and it will highlight all of the other places on the breadboard where the wire connects. The next step was to rationalize the map with the schematics. I fumbled along for a while trying to make progress here. I found the gates on the schematics that matched on the breadboard. I started labeling the pins. This was helping me make progress and then I improved the process by also labeling the chips as well. I used the battleship coordinate system. Each breadboard has a unique letter, and each chip has a unique number from left to right. In retrospect, this process seems obvious and was super helpful in finding discrepancies be uh, between the model and the schematics. In the end, I went through every connection on the breadboard wire by wire at least once and maybe more, and reconciled with the schematic. The process helped me find some duplicated logic, and I simplified and also some better ways of connecting things. In the end, it turned out to be an optimization pass too. I printed the breadboard model onto a three foot square vinyl banner and have it hanging on my wall. It still blows my mind that this whole thing is working and it's fun to look at and to remember. I then started the process of laying out the PCB. I made a few decisions here. I decided to use SMD parts for the passive components, the capacitors, resistors, and diodes. The board is getting pretty big and complex. Also, I want to practice SMD soldering and design. These parts have names like 1206 or 0402. The first two numbers are the 100th of an inch in length, and the second two are a hundredth of an inch in width. So 0402 means that the part is four one-hundredths of an inch long and two one-hundredths of an inch wide. Wow, that's small. This is gonna be a challenge to solder. As usual, there are metric designations as well. I got rid of the ROM disk. I now have two micro SD for the custom DOS and Apple II disk emulation. The font ROM is big, and I can fit 64 fonts. I decided to hook up some of the font ROM pins to the uh, I.O. from one of the AY38910 I.O. ports. These ports are basically unused, and I've verified that I can control them in software. I broke out two of the I.O. ports to pin headers so that I have some GPIO for future projects. On the font ROM, eight of the address lines select the byte, four of the address lines select the row of the character, and five address lines select the font. The fonts are 16-row DOS fonts. So 16 bytes, where each byte represents a bitmap of the row. Given a byte in a row, the byte output of the ROM is fed to a shift register and output one pixel at a time. The font ROM is also used for low-res graphics. In that case, the output byte is latched, and the bytes are fed directly to the red, green, and blue VGA circuits. Technically, the machine could support 64 different low-res palettes from 64 possible colors. Right now, the palette matches the Apple II low-res color only. This could change through reflashing the ROM, which can happen at any time. 
I added jumpers to the system ROM. The system ROM is an SST 39SF040 and has a 512 KB capacity. I'm only using part of the 64 KB range for the system ROM. I can easily add three switches and create eight different ROM variations. I'd like to try some alternative ROMs to see if I can get better software compatibility. The custom DOS, FAT32, and microSD routines are huge. Maybe I'll try a ROM version that includes AppleSoft Basic and excludes the custom DOS to make some room. I can use jumpers to select the ROM or maybe I'll get some big chunky switches and mount them on the outside of the case. I decided to make the board conform to the ATX standard. This drastically improves the case options. I can also use the PC power supply and integrate with the power button, the reset button, the power and hard disk LEDs. I ordered this case. It has a nice glass side and some LEDs which should be great for display. I got the ATX spec from archive.org. I read a few days ago that archive.org was hacked, and it doesn't look to be up now. If we just lost archive.org, that would be a massive loss for humanity. I sure hope it comes back. To use the power switch, I did some investigation on the PC power supply. The power supply is cool because it provides 5 volts and 3.3 volt power, 12 volts as well, which I'm not going to use. When you plug the power supply in, there's a pin that generates a constant low current 5 volts. The other power rails are disabled until the power on pin is pulled low. I created a circuit that runs off of the low current constant 5 volts, and it's just a flip-flop. When the power button is pressed, it toggles the state of the output. That output then either pulls the power on pin to low or 5 volts. I wired it up on breadboards. Here the yellow LED is driven by the low current constant 5 volts. If the power supply is plugged in, this pin has power. The blue LED is wired to the main 5 volt output of the power supply. If the the blue LED is on, it's like the computer is on. Pressing the switch is like pressing the power button on the case. One quick clarification, I've been saying that power on pin, there are two pins, power on and PS on. Pulling PS on low is what turns on the power supply. Power on is an output pin that is used to indicate that the power output from the power supply is stable. I'm not going to use that pin, and don't try wiring the wrong pin low. Read the spec. Check out these little specs. Yeah, that's not dust. Those are 1206 surface mount resistors. Wow. I laid out the chips. I was tempted to go enlist in the KiCad project and add a new feature. KiCad has something called the rat's nest. When you lay out your components on the PCB before you've made the connections, it will draw lines to the nearest connection for every pin. It looks like a rat's nest. The tool lets you visually eyeball the complexity. The feature I'd like to add is one that tells you the total distance of all the rat's nest lines as well as the number of times they cross. This would be useful in testing the impact of component placement and make it possible to move in the right direction. In the end, the layout looks pretty similar to the breadboard but not exactly the same. I use the auto router because I can't imagine not using it. 45th time was the charm. In the end, I decided to build a four layer board, two signal planes, and a ground and power plane. I think this will give me the best results. I asked the folks at RPCB on Reddit about decoupling capacitors and found some great material from TI that helped me decide to keep them and where to place them and why. And here is a 3D render. I sent it off to JLC PCB and I'm waiting for the boards to arrive. I sure hope they work. There's a non-zero chance I'll be ordering a second time. Meanwhile, I've been playing with dye sublimation and I printed this little Ultima 4 map. There's a project called HRUMP, the High-Res Ultima Map Project. Someone's taking high-res scans of all the Ultima maps and making them available. I also decided to print a giant tapestry, and here that is. And I'll close out with footage of me playing Ultima 4 on my breadboard computer. I'm thinking of doing a video on the graphics system. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching. If there's any part that you'd like to know more about, please let me know.